Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see all of you. My name is Alan Denny. I'm the uh, middle school R and R chair in the state of Colorado. And um, you guys are in for a treat. I'd like to introduce to you Wes Sparks. Wes just completed his fifth year teaching vocal music at Eagle View Middle School in Colorado Springs. He was accepted at the University of Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music as a double major in piano and trumpet performance, graduating with his bachelor's degree in trumpet in 2010. Wes became more involved with vocal pedagogy after college through accompanying, church directing, and being a long-term sub and attending Colorado College for his master's degree. After accepting his current job at Eagle View, Wes auditioned for the Colorado Springs Chorale and has performed in groups since 2014. He lives in Castle Rock with his wife Melinda, who teaches math at Lower Central High School. They both coach Ultimate Frisbee. <laughs> Melinda at the U.S. Air Force Academy, Wes at Air Academy High School. The Eagle View's choirs consistently receive superior and best overall ratings at festival, and their eighth grade choir was fortunate enough to be selected to perform at this year's CMEA. So would you welcome Wes Sparks. Thank you all for being here, and thank you, Alan, for the invitation to speak. Uh, it's really exciting to get the chance to share some ideas with you and hopefully give you some um, concepts that you might be able to use to help grow your program, help recruit students, help retain the right kind of students that you want to make your program um, as strong as possible. Um, and ultimately, uh, hopefully our, all of our goal is to have all of our students be lifelong appreciators of music. Right? We know that not all of our students are going to be professional musicians. Um, hopefully some of them might choose that route, some of them might be teachers like us. But even if it's just as audience members, as adults, that can appreciate the work that goes on um, in what we do, and parents that cultivate the next generation of musicians, um, hopefully it's my goal for my students that they have an appreciation and a love for music that carries through with them no matter how long they stay in our classes, no matter how long they stay in, in choral training, but instead with them for the rest of their lives, no matter what their career. One thing that I'd like to keep in mind for that is that a lot of our students don't start where we did. Um, I was fortunate enough to be raised by parents who love classical music. I was in piano lessons class four. I went to the symphony as a kid. A lot of us probably had similar experiences, but our kids aren't necessarily as nerdy as we all are. And that's okay, because they can still develop that appreciation over time if they're around music for long enough that they can cultivate that same appreciation that, that we've all grown to have um, and that we all love about being involved with choral music, classical music, um, whatever your specialties might be. And for me, it's really that love from the students of what they do that I focus on to keep them in it. Um, yes, techniques are important. Yes, getting the notes right are important. Um, rehearsal etiquette, all those things. But if they don't love what they're doing, if they're not passionate about coming back to your classroom, that's when I fear that I'm gonna lose my student, regardless of their quality as an individual musician. Um, recruiting them, retaining them, cultivating that inspiration in them, that's something that will help them develop musically over time, help them develop technically over time, and hopefully become self self <coughs> excuse me. Um, and that comes from your day-to-day -day interactions with your students. It's not about your pedigree as a teacher, it's not about the results your ensemble gets at the festival. We like to put a lot of weight on that, especially internally to ourselves, um, but the day-to-day -day interactions that you have with your kids are gonna be what really helps inspire them, and the more they're inspired, the longer they're gonna stay, the longer they stay, the more they develop, and that's hopefully what we can all strive to achieve with as many of our students as possible. Um, so as Alan said, uh, I teach down at Eagle View Middle School. I'm gonna give you a little history of my program, just so you know the context that I'm coming from, whether it parallels yours or not. Uh, you might see some similarities in, in your own experience. My school is a school of about 960 students. I am the second choir director in the school's 32 year history. Uh, the teacher that preceded me opened the building in 1986 and was there for 27 years. Wow. So I heard a lot in my first year, big shoes to fill, all those colloquialisms that, wow. that we hear. But it did also did come with a very established program which I was very thankful to walk into. My first year, I had 230 students enrolled in choir. The sixth and seventh grade choirs were semester only options. And then eighth grade was year long for girls, but semester only for boys. And that eighth grade choir was by audition. Adopting the 
previous director's schedule, I also taught sixth grade drama, seventh grade arts appreciation, a semester of eighth grade beginning guitar, a semester of co-teaching the musical, and six of eight combined orchestra when the teacher left in February. So I was left with seven preps, no repeated classes, and no planning time as a first year teacher. So we all have those times where it's like, what's too much and, and what do I care about? So that helped me develop a lot of ideas about what's really important to me. Uh, in my classrooms and, and what I care about, as I'm sure all of you have come with, with for yourselves as well. So the other thing that's unique about our school is we have an academic arts academy. Now this doesn't make us a performing arts school in the model of DSA, but we do have one team per grade, so a third of our school, that uses arts integration in their four classes. So it's a different model for learning. It's actually a model after a structure coming out of the Kennedy Center. And for this arts integration, Instead of just taking pen and paper, worksheets, tests, all that kind of stuff, students will come up with a short scene and act out a historical event for their test. They'll wrap math equations, they'll paint chemistry concepts, they'll come up with playlists that line up with literary characters in English novels that they're reading. And this does a couple things for my students and my program. One of it is that it embeds a really high level of interest for the arts in some of my students, um, and also support from their parents and their families. But the interesting structure of my school, since we aren't a performing arts school, it is just arts integration, it's a chunk of the school that does this, all the exploratory classes are still integrated school-wide. So the students who are in the Academic Arts Academy, they're in with the rest of the student population in choir, in band, and it creates a really interesting dynamic because there are these students who are really invested in the arts and then students who are maybe more averagely invested in the arts. And they all come together for our exploratory classes. And our school is fortunate to have 25 different exploratory options. And our school does not prescribe any classes. So it gives the students a ton of choice, which is wonderful. But it does also mean that as teachers, each one of us needs to market our program against 24 other classes with less than a thousand students and they get their choices and they get to do what they want to um, which is wonderful but it, it does imply a little bit of pressure from year to year and interaction to interaction to make sure that our programs are still sustainable. So coming in in that first year I had a few disillusions about being a first year teacher, walking into this program. I thought I'm young, I'm male, I'm coming into the choir world Half my class is going to be guys here too. Didn't happen, right? Um, I also thought that my values as a musician were just going to transfer immediately to my students. They were going to love classical music. They were going to have great rehearsal etiquette. Yeah. Um, they were going to practice at home with all these wonderful strategies, use practice logs like I did when I was in school. A lot of that didn't happen right away either, and it's still a work in progress. Um, and one of the biggest delusions that I had was that I single-handedly was going to be able to retain every student in my program. And I had to come to terms with that pretty early on. Uh, the rule of thumb that I ended up hearing, I don't know if any of you have heard this as well, is the 80% year-to-year. So if you can retain 80% of your students from 6th to 7th, 7th to 8th, etc., then you're in good, good shape to have a sustainable program, both within your building and within your feeder structure. So I, I had to reframe a couple of those things for myself. And moving forwards, there are a few positives and negatives that, that really helped me develop my own structure out of this previous director's program. The first was, in my second year in the building, I advocated to my administration that choir should have a year-long option. Now, it's not completely year-long. Students can still take that semester class in sixth or seventh. But the argument I made was that our class is no different than band or orchestra. We have young musicians learning a skill, and they need to repeat it frequently in order to be good at it. So I went to my administration and said, hey, for the kids that really care about this, they're really passionate about this, can we offer them a chance that they take you on choir? And then the only difference is that they do all the concerts throughout the year. Right? I don't repeat any repertoire within a grade level within a given school year. So it allows the students just more exposure and eight months of singing versus four months of singing. Right? Over three years, they're quite truly twice as good, right? Just because they've been in the room more, regardless of the quality of my rehearsals. Um, the, another thing that I added that was a positive is in my third year, I added an after-school advanced women's choir. Uh, they meet once a week, starting in mid-October to the end of the school year. 
Uh, it offered the, the girls a lower commitment level, but a higher performance level. So for the students who were classically trained that were being frustrated by the altos not being able to catch a harmony fast enough, that were being frustrated by the boys changing voices or the boys changing maturity levels, whatever the case may be, those students now have an outlet to sing at a higher level um, and commit to that if they were able to. Uh, it's after school, so a lot of my students who are also athletes still have conflicts with that, but it still provides a structure for a number of the students who are interested in that higher level performance. Uh, my third and fifth year, I added a men's choir during one of our enrichment periods. Uh, they meet every other week for 30 minutes once a sem or for one semester. I think that adds up to like five hours of total rehearsal. It's a rush. Uh, <laughs> everything happens fast. It's just enough time to learn and memorize two songs for a festival, but it, it also gives me the opportunity to build some connections with those boys, have them have a safe space where they can work on their changing voice, have older students model appropriate vocal tone for them. Uh, the reason I didn't do it in my fourth year is, again, from a disillusion. I thought that I was going to start this men's choir, all the boys were going to flood into my choir classes the next year, and it, everything was going to be great. Uh, the boys that I did get were few, and they didn't necessarily add to the quality of my ensembles. So I backed off year four, but then last year uh, I did a couple things where my eighth grade choir does men's and women's feature, or tenor bass and treble features in the concert. So I paralleled the men's choir repertoire to my eighth grade men's feature, and then when they performed, the eighth graders were embedded experts on the repertoire, and I basically had ringers in the group, which helped a lot. Um, and that has really helped us gain more boys and give them more equity, equity of opportunity to be involved in choral music, even at lower commitment levels. The last really positive thing that our school has is we are a bring your own device school. So every student in our building now, it's been a three year process, has their own laptop. I realize this isn't financially feasible in every district, in every program, in every community, but there are a couple things that I've done with that that even without laptops, even without devices, using something as simple as a cell phone, I think there are some strategies that can be used that aid the development of your program, development of your singers. Um, so I use a combination of GarageBand and Google Classroom to record and upload part tracks. So I just go into GarageBand and record individual voice parts to a metronome track so they have a clip track and they can feel that pulse. And then I upload those files to Google Classroom. It's password protected within our district to avoid the files getting out and being copyright issues. And then we use those part tracks. Some students take them home to practice. Other students um, use them in class when we run sectionals. And it's been really, really valuable to have the students, again, have that frequency of repetition. Because when we get into more advanced repertoire, like sixth grade scram alto, you're singing 50% of the time, if not more, that's fine. But when we start getting into four, five, six, eight part divisi, having the second sopranos sing their part once and then wait for the other seven sections to rep their part and then come back around and try and remember what their part sounds like is way less useful to them as musicians and to me as a director than having them go into the hall and run it eight times in half an hour, they're not going to run it eight times in a row. But <laughs> having them run it frequently, and so they're using their voices more, they're training their ears more, they're finding those patterns, they're figuring out their techniques, and they're doing it in a setting where not only do they get repetition, but they also get isolation from other sections. Mm -hmm. So using Google Classroom for sectionals and having that frequency of repetition has been really helpful um, for the speed at which my students are able to uh, master some of their music. Uh, another thing that is a structure at my school, um, has positives and negatives, is that my middle school is a one-to-one -one feeder to Air Academy High School. So there are no other middle schools helping me out when the kids do get up to the high school. Um, when the students go up, they know exactly what to expect. Uh, we've got a really good relationship from middle school to high school and a lot of exchanges that happen. However, there's no backup if I'm not doing my job well enough. And also for those of you who know the marching band world in Colorado, Air Academy has a little bit of a reputation. Um, so the choir is kind of the underdog at that high school. Air Academy has like 20 state marching band championships. Uh, it's a big identity point for the school, more so than the football team. 
which isn't the case at the high school I went to. Um, but it, it does mean that the students who choose choir, even in sixth grade, know that they're stepping into something that might be a little bit looked down upon, and then figuring out how to manage that for them, and know that they're not in the coolest thing, or the most prestigious thing, or the thing that has the most visibility, perhaps, um, has been an interesting thing to, to kind of figure out. A couple drawbacks to coming into this position, and some things that I'm still working through. Um, I'm not sure if any of you else have experienced this, but a little bit of imposter syndrome at some point in your career. Um, as Alan said, I was a piano player and a trumpet player growing up. Uh, my undergrad was in trumpet performance. I quit choir in sixth grade. And until I was 23, that was the last time I had sung. I had no vocal training from seventh grade all the way through college. And it made it difficult for me to be confident stepping into a choral classroom as a director and as a, a perceived expert. Um, the reason I quit, coincidentally, is because my school required me to choose between band and choir. I chose trumpet, I continued on that route, um, continued playing piano as well. But since then, I've worked to gain as much experience as I, I've been able to. Um, like Alan said, I, I was an accompanist for a high school program. I longed to sub as a middle school choir director. I've been a church music director in the past, sing the Colorado Springs Chorale, be here, talk with all of you, you know, sessions at CMEA, observing all state rehearsals and what those level of conductors do have all been things that I've found really beneficial to trying to gain as much knowledge as I can, specifically involving um, the vocal pedagogy. What this led me to, especially early on in my rehearsal, is that I wasn't very comfortable demonstrating things in class, and I also wasn't very comfortable talking about techniques in class. The positive of that is that my kids sang all the time, right? Because I wasn't going to stop rehearsal for three minutes and give a lecture on one specific technique or talk for five minutes about the interpretation of a piece, which while valid, especially with young singers, talking with them for ten minutes doesn't let them try anything. As far as I know, there are no sports in the world where the coach will sit the team down, talk to them for two hours, and then say, get out and play your opponent, good luck. Right? They try the skill, they get experience with it, they have frequency and repetition, and my kids got a lot of that very early on, maybe more than they needed to, um, but I, I've worked on managing that since then, and that has led me to kind of figure out what my priorities are. Uh, a couple other restrictions, our school doesn't have a schedule that's conducive to any mixed grade level options as a class for kids. So I've got no during the day opportunity for 6th graders to hear 8th graders on a regular basis, for 8th graders to be mentors to 7th graders. Um, it's all grade by grade, and like I said earlier, the schedule conflicts outside of school can, can pose some barriers with sports and clubs and all that. Um, my 8th grade class is still audition only. The barrier there is that for my students who don't make the audition class, there's nowhere for them to go in eighth grade. And that's really tough to see for the students who maybe haven't developed musically as much as their classmates, but care as much as their classmates do, in some cases more. Um, so I'm still working to try and find some solutions for that that allows them to have an opportunity in my schedule. Because without that, they go from seventh to ninth grade and gap with a gap in between um, without having an opportunity to sing at school. Um, so, looking at where I'm at now, um, I, in your packet on the first page, there was the, the breakdown of, of where my school was at when I walked in. Now, for my program, um, I've got 290 singers enrolled in class, and uh, 91 of them are male identified singers. School wide, I've got, I'm projecting for next year that we're going to have 330 singers involved, including choir, musical, women's choir men's choir, and that by choice ends up being 34% of our student population still against those 24 other exploratory classes. Some of the big changes that I've seen are that for next year's seventh grade class, 20 of my new students are men who've never been in choir before. The majority of them, like 17 or 18 of them, came directly over from men's choir. So I saw them for five hours as sixth graders and now they're doing semester or year-long choir by choice in seventh grade. Um, I think having them, giving them the chance to be exposed to choral music in a low commitment and relatively low pressure setting really helped them experience what the end product of 
performed could be, and that helps sway their decisions to be a part of choir next year. Um, like I said, I've got 91 students overall who are male identified that are in, enrolled in choir next year. Um, I'm with men's choir and projecting that that number is going to be 115 guys, which is 261% of the guys that I started with um, from my first year. And my percentage of male enrollment has also gone up from year one to this upcoming school year from 18 to 31 percent. Um, and the program overall has, has grown by nearly 100 kids as well. Uh, one of the other big changes that I've seen is in each of the past few years, my sixth to seventh grade numbers have been healthy. Um, we were talking earlier about the 80 percent rule, and last year I had 96 students enrolled in sixth grade choir coming into the building. Um, by that 80% rule, you'd expect 77, 77 of them to continue into 7th grade. I have 133 enrolled in 7th grade next year. So that there's been a big push um, among their peers and also very intentional choices on my part to do things that encourage those students to join. And another great thing that I've seen is my students' willingness to be challenged on harder repertoire. So when we get time to go to festival, um, preparing for all-state auditions, learning all-state repertoire, the, the kids' willingness to take that on has been really, really good to see. And one of the things I really try and frame for them and, and work very hard to instill in them is that the judges' readings are not what they're focusing on when they sing the hardest rep that they're exposed to. Right? We want them to enjoy the process of learning the repertoire, learn new skills through it, and then be proud of accomplishing those skills. But if that means that they get an excellent instead of a superior, but they believe in the value of what they've learned, that's going to bring them back way more likely than them getting a superior, but not truly being proud of what they've done. Um, another quote that I love to hear from students is, this is my favorite piece. Alan and I were actually talking about this over lunch today. And that quote never comes from the pop songs. It's always from the hardest piece they've done. No matter how difficult it is or how imperfect their performance may have been, they latch onto that challenge and want to get better. They, they yearn for that. Um, I have a student who was a seventh grader last year who by all accounts you consider a pop singer, um, self-taught pianist, sings exclusively pop songs. We were doing um, a piece that I got later in your packet for you called Indodana. That's a traditional South African song. Two weeks into rehearsal, we hadn't even put lyrics on it yet. We were still singing everything on solfege. She comes up to me after rehearsal and says, this is my favorite piece that we've ever done. I love that we're doing it. Can we do more pieces like this? And that was really powerful for me, especially considering what I considered her mindset to be regarding musical priorities. Um, another group of students that I've come across that quote with are the boys in my men's choir especially this past year with my 7th and 8th grade boys. We did a piece by Braden Ayers, who used to be in Colorado as a teacher, and he's also a composer, called Journeyman Song. And the text in this piece gives the guys so much to latch on to. It's emotionally deep. Um, it gives the boys a chance to be fragile and vulnerable. And all these things are not something that middle school boys normally are okay with doing, right? There's a stigma about being a boy in choir, there's a stigma about being emotional as a young adolescent male. And the number of boys who came up to me and said, I love that we're doing this piece. I connect with this piece. This phrase or this lyric or this verse really connects with me and my experience um, was incredibly powerful, especially for text that talked about being emotional and being vulnerable and avoided all the stereotypes of toxic masculinity that a lot of men's choir pieces can come across. Um, so having that interaction with my students, I think says a lot about what their experience has been like. And then the last thing that really speaks to me about my students and their values as young artists is that they stop asking the same pop repertoire by eighth grade. Those conversations happen in my program, but they're almost exclusively from sixth and seventh graders. Honestly, by the time they get to eighth grade, they know that they're better musicians than just singing something off the radio. That's verse, chorus, verse, chorus, repeat, call it good. Um, the, the students that want that challenge, that want to be pushed, those are the students that I've been fortunate enough to be able to retain in my program, and it also makes things very easy for my high school director, with that one-to-one -one theater, 
because she doesn't have to do anything for convincing students about the values of classical music, because by the end of seventh grade, they're done with their pop music phase. So that leads me to repertoire selection. And um, at the end of your packet, I've got a lot of stuff for you that we'll talk about regarding repertoire selection. Um, but my goals for repertoire for my students are to meet them where they are, both in maturity level and their own experiences, and give them something, like we talked about earlier, that will develop their love of music and their connection to music, and in turn, get them to come back next year, so that over time, and this is like their lifetime, they develop that wider appreciation of music, of other genres, of other cultures, but none of this happens if they quit. Mm -hmm. And it's a simple truth, but if, if we come in, and the, the student that I talked about earlier, Emma, the pop singer, if I give them that South African piece, a cappella, on solfege, day one, sixth grade, welcome to middle school, she might not have made it to seventh grade choir. But because she stepped through the process, developed her own skills, and then also developed her own appreciation, she's still in it, and she has that love for it, and appreciation, and is willing to take on something that isn't just off of the radio. So, my whole goal is getting students to love classical music. I start that goal by boring them to death with pop music. And it may seem like a really weird approach. Um, early on, I just used a hook piece, right? First piece of the year, here's a pop song, everything else is classical. And then a couple years later, I was like, what if I did two hook pieces? And then I went to three or four, even five songs that were familiar to the students, but still had enough depth in the arrangement to challenge them to develop their skills and allow them to work out techniques that they needed to through the rehearsal process, but still relying on current appreciation of music. And it's their appreciation, not ours. So being in tune with their generation, I think is really important. It didn't work for my parents' generation to be told that rock music sucks and they shouldn't listen to it. Um, it didn't work for my generation to be told that the Backstreet Boys were horrible, even though yeah. Um, but for our students, we can't step into a classroom and say, my opinion as a professional musician is that your music is horrible, join me. They're probably not going to listen to you, right? So I want to pick music that they connect with, but I also know I can teach important skills too. So when I'm looking for pop arrangements, I'm not just looking for something that's catchy. I'm looking for something that teaches the harmony parts to sing parallel thirds and sixths and melody, that teaches value unification, consonant releases, text emphasis, pitched consonants, that stupid little grace note that they always do on ascending intervals, right? <laughs> Teaching ways to take that out so they actually sing the interval clean. Um, if I can find pieces that have really cool harmonic color where one of the sections sings a major seventh to the root of the chord or a ninth to the root of the chord, all those things that they're going to need advanced choral singing, I pick pieces that develop that for them early on, but they don't know that they're being tricked into learning those skills. Um, so there's an upfront cost to using popular repertoire in your programs, so I try and find pieces that I can use for two or three years running. It's not the most viable financially, but it's really no different than using a classical song once every five years for 15 years if you can use the same arrangement for two or three years running. And I also want to make sure that they're able to find success through what they're singing so that they get bored and move past the pop music. So when my students start getting antsy about another pop song or hearing the third part of the melody really fast, that's when I start to tune in and say, okay, they're ready to be pushed, they're ready for a harder arrangement. Maybe they're ready for something in a foreign language, but I'm only willing to push them to that point when they're ready for that classical appreciation, and they've shown that they can master the fundamental skills in a context that's familiar to them. The biggest trick I use for my students is that I use festival performance as my pivot point. I turn the judges into the enemy. Judges, if you're in here, we still love you. Um, but when we get to festival, we've done a year and a half all sixth grade, first semester, seventh grade, pop music over and over, learning parallel thirds, learning dynamics. And then we get to the point where we need to get ready for festival music, and I say, the judges want to hear something different. And I blame it on them. Because 
it takes me out from being the bad guy. Right? The students never come back to me and say, well, why did you choose this Latin piece? Why did you choose this South African folk song? I say, that's what the judges want to hear. They want to hear how much you can do. And I frame it as a challenge to them of showing your range as a musician, your range as an artist, the depth of your cultural awareness. And then the students latch on to that because all of a sudden it's an us against them mentality. But the us involves me as the director. And the students are invested in that. And then they know that the, the judges are experts, they're high school directors, college directors, professional directors, and they still value the judges' opinions when we do get to festival. Um, but I really make sure that the students know that that's what the next step is for them, and that it's something that they can strive to achieve and I can help get them there. Um, but I make it so that the students don't blame me for making that pivot point, because if it becomes me against them, then the relationship in rehearsal is so much different. So for recruitment for our students, getting new students into our program, one of the big things I focus on is visibility. So there's a number of performance opportunities that we have at my school. Um, I'm sure you have some that are similar where we do school concert previews. So for the, um, the whole sixth grade, for example, the students who are not in choir come up to the auditorium, Choir students do a preview of their concert. The rest of the sixth graders have to listen to it. Sorry, get to listen to it. Um, whether or not they like it or not at the time. Um, there's opportunities to perform at lunch. We have an incoming fifth grade tour day that happens every year where we're able to perform with the students who are about to move in the building. Little concerts in the hall during the passing period. And all this helps plant a seed in students' minds that aren't in the program that, hey, this is an option to me. It's something that's available to me. Even if it's a room that I haven't been in yet. A lot of times they'll just walk by a classroom and, oh yeah, that's the choir room. Oh yeah, that's the band room. I don't go there. Right? But having that visibility and that connection with them and, again, that frequency of, hey, you, you could still do this. It's not too late for this. Hey, audition for 8th grade choir. Those things, I think, really help make it an okay thing for the students to step through that threshold um, of our classroom doors. One of the other things that I still want to try is Chris and Nathan's idea from last year about breakfast burritos or free oh, pizza or whatever it was. Yeah. Um, and offering students free food for singing for 10 seconds. Um, the idea sounded awesome. I did not have time to implement it last year, but hopefully I'll be able to get that going this year. Another huge thing for visibility are t-shirts or hoodies that promote your program. The thing with these is they actually have to look good. They can't just be some dorky design with an inside joke that your kids get and nobody else cares about, because then that becomes another us against them thing within your school, right? The shirt has to say choir, and it has to be apparent what the kids are promoting, because that allows other students in the building to see what their options are, and hopefully, it also encourages students who are like-minded to the kids you already have to join. Because typically, one of your students' friend groups, they're going to have a similar mentality. So if you want more students like that kid, have them wear a choir shirt, their friends see it when they're sitting at the lunch table, then all of a sudden, that idea is planted in their mind, and it gives you free marketing in your, in your, uh, in your building for your program. The very first year I did this, I kind of admittedly thought it was cheesy. I didn't know how it was going to go over. It's like, yeah, this is an idea, but it's probably going to be insular. It's just for us. No big deal. So we get the t-shirts in, I pass them out to the kids. The next morning when I walked through the hallways, I couldn't look a single direction and not see a shirt. It was one of the most powerful visuals I've ever had in my building of how many kids are involved and how many kids are proud of being involved in our programs. But having that walking billboard um, and that free marketing was, was really, really valuable. And it gives your program similar social credibility to sports programs. Right? The basketball team will win a game, they'll wear their jerseys the next day. The softball team has matching hoodies and sweatpants because it's a softball team. And having an equal social standing, especially in middle school, I think is incredibly valuable. So our kids see that it's okay to be an individual, it's okay to do what you care about, and it's okay to, to follow something um, about which you're very passionate. Another thing that I really do for recruitment is talking with students about their interests getting their ideas for rep suggestions. Alan mentioned something about the Disney girls that also do an all-Disney concert in a session this morning. Um, I'll hear those ideas out, 
I'll listen to a kid talk to me for two weeks straight every single day about some video game that he's playing. Mm -hmm. I'm not a video game person, but I will listen every single day if that's what he's interested in and that's what he wants to share with me, because that's an opportunity for him to make a connection with me. And if he trusts me in that outside of rehearsal conversation, then I hope that he's more likely to trust me in rehearsal when I ask him to take a risk, when I ask him to sing with more tone or be a leader within his section. Um, so having those conversations, I think is really important. Giving students the opportunity to have shared experiences with one another, whether it's in sectionals, um, outside of school activities, concerts, field trips, festival, all state, all those wonderful things. Um, one thing that I really want to get better at, again, that I haven't implemented, is actually getting into the building at my theater schools. Um, my high school director is phenomenal at this, coming down to our school, doing tour concerts, workshopping our kids. I have not set foot in one of my elementary schools in five years, and I feel really bad about that. Um, so one of my goals for the next year is to meet my incoming students before they're actually in my building, um, and try and have a chance to develop those connections with them. And we've decided to start um, a theater strand in honor choir. So we've got four elementaries, a middle school, and a high school in our theater strand. And so next year we're gonna do an honor choir um, that allows the elementary students to work with me, the middle school students to work with high school director, high school students will have a guest commission come in. And I'm hoping that that's the start of a pretty consistent relationship where I get the chance to meet those kids early on. All that brings me to the biggest recruitment factor that we have, and it's not in your control. It's the word of mouth of your students. Um, like I said, in my first year, I thought I was going to come in, be young, energetic, male, and I was going to solve all my problems, and it didn't. Um, especially in the past two or three years, the biggest thing that I've seen when I talk to students about, why are you in fire? Why did you decide to join in the first place? Why did you decide to stay? Their two answers are either, the older group sounded good and I liked it, or somebody told me I had to. So that means that somebody involved in the program in the other 23 hours of their day voluntarily talked about what we did, good, bad, or otherwise, hopefully good, um, and took the time to recruit somebody else, whether it was a parent or a sibling or a peer. Those one-on-one -on -one conversations that happen outside of your classroom, outside of your program, are the biggest things that affect the recruitment of your students. And I found this is true for male and female singers. This is true for um, privileged and underprivileged students. No matter what their background, and what, no matter what their own experience is, it's that invitation to connect with somebody that they already trust that really has had the biggest impact on why they decide to come into the program. And again, it's not the festival ratings, it's not our college degrees, it's directors, all that helps us what we do in rehearsal, but it's not what helps recruit our students. It's giving them an opportunity to have an experience that's so memorable that they want someone else to share it with them. So when I'm looking at how I retain students and keep them in the program once I already have them, I want them to have as much pride as possible in what they do. So this is pride for the work that they put in, the results of their hard work, quality of their performance, and the respect that they have for themselves and one another. And I also want, to in, want them to enjoy the rehearsal process. I was talking earlier about you know, having a rehearsal where you lecture for 10 minutes and they sing for 10 seconds. So we've all been in those rehearsals, and occasionally that's necessary. But my goal is for my rehearsals to be as upbeat and as fast-paced as possible, so that the students not only don't really have time to kind of check out and unwind, they didn't have time to think about what they could be doing otherwise. Right? It's always, what are we doing next? How are we doing it? How are we implementing these ideas? Um, and finding things to be happy about. Because if you can celebrate the things that are happening well in rehearsal, more than you criticize the things that still need work, and there will be, I think that creates a different culture and a different environment in your rehearsal process than just sitting there and telling them everything that's wrong that they already knew. Um, a joke that I always make is that repertoire selection is 90% of my job, um, because if I pick the right music that connects to the kids and they enjoy the rehearsal process on that music, then retention and recruitment almost happens by itself, but it takes work on the front end. So reading sessions here, you know, digging through excerpts on, online over the summer, and also knowing your students' personalities to really connect with what they want to be a part of, 
and then allowing students to hear their success, to see their success over time by taking them to the festival, by listening to recordings of their performances, um, by contrasting week one recordings versus concert recordings, and so they can see how much they've grown and reflect on that um, and be proud of that. Another thing that I really focus on for retention of students is connecting to them and making sure that I'm responsive to their own experiences. So their cultural experience, their emotional experience, their personal life experience, and finding repertoire that reflects their heritage, reflects things that happened in their lives. Um, the, the demographic that I work with, a number of my students struggle with family divorce. I found a couple pieces that the text addresses some of the, the struggles with divorce, and some of the students who've been the most disconnected in my class connect to that piece and don't let go because it's finally something that they understand. Right? It's just not another pop song about love. Um, also finding songs that focus on themes of unity. Um, a lot of us teach teenagers. They're emotional. They're angsty. Find a piece that sings about that. It's okay for them to express that on stage. Um, and I try and find pieces that allow the, the text and the genre to reflect that connection first, but still maintaining the quality teaching opportunities in the arrangement that I was talking about earlier. And then, after I gain their trust, that's when I start pushing them. That's when I start stretching them to maybe gain a new experience through a repertoire that they wouldn't have chosen um, otherwise for themselves. So I know I said I, I do a lot of work early on singing pop repertoire. One of my biggest fears of doing that was that I was going to lose my highest quality musicians, the kids who were in piano lessons, violin lessons. Those kids haven't left my program because my approach to the music is still classically oriented. It's not just sing a pop song and call it good enough. It's every single vocal technique that you would teach them in any other song. It's just on content that's already familiar to them. Um, like I said earlier, having that repetition in rehearsal has been really powerful. So affording myself the opportunity to talk less and the kids an opportunity to sing more as frequently as possible so that they can figure some things out on the fly and maybe just get three shots at it. Maybe that's what they need instead of one take and then a lecture about how they got it wrong and then they forget what they were trying to do in the first place, right? Just let them try it three times and by the third time, if you've instructed them in the right way and given them the right cues, they'll still make improvements as they go through. Obviously stopping for egregious errors. If there's enough vocal tension that they're gonna hurt themselves or they're pulling somebody off the part they're supposed to be on. If those things will stop for, but as much as possible, letting them sing as frequently as possible in rehearsal um, in order to get that repetition in class. Um, and then the last thing I do to retain students is that I promote that there's more to come if they stay. So field trips in older years, seventh and eighth grade having a chance to do all state auditions, have a festival, form solo and ensemble, placement auditions, sing in honor choirs, all that is kind of a there's still more to go. It is really powerful for retaining, especially the, the higher level students who might otherwise get bored and leave because they're not moving fast enough. Um, so like I said, having those individual outlets is helpful, having honor choirs, the summer choir the last year from the school was great, our theater standard honor choirs. Um, also, preparing students for all state auditions is a great place for me to teach classical technique um, and have the higher level students who are ready for that kind of rep be exposed to it while still training the less experienced musicians. Um, so we teach all state preparation for about four to six weeks going into the all state audition, um, whole class instruction. I teach them the segment on solfege, figure out key signatures by the last sharp is T, the last flat would be fa, um, finding their starting notes through that, um, doing a sight reading boot camp. And my goal is that every student, whether or not they choose to take the audition, is completely prepared by the time the auditions arrive, but it's optional for them to take that. Um, having that choice for them, optional opportunities, is really important to me. Um, but even with the All-State audition being optional, I've had anywhere from 80 to 120 kids voluntarily audition for middle school All-State every year that I've done it. And it's because they're ready. And I put in the time to make sure that they're confident, schedule time after school, during lunches, whatever, to record their individual auditions. And then once the kids who make it come back, they have an embedded enthusiasm for non-pop repertoire, right? And that also happens second semester, seventh grade. So all of a sudden they go up to Denver, they go to Allstate, they sing with other singers at their level, they work with these nationally renowned conductors, and they come back and they lead by example.
could they learn these new techniques that frame it to the rest of the choir as, again, it's not the kids who went all the kids who didn't. It's that the kids coming back are becoming integrated into the program and improving everybody through their experiences um, that they had up at Allstate. And then those kids are also people who have to do more rep like that going forwards and doing more challenging music. So what all that leads me to, um, regardless of what you think about doing pop repertoire, whether or not it changes your mind on that, whether you want to do some of it or all of it, um, and hopefully you've got some important things for recruitment and retention, is that as a director, it truly matters what you say and what you do in your interactions with students for the culture of your program and whether or not your program truly feels like the place where students can belong. Um, the honest truth is that not every kid in our class likes us, and that's okay. Right? There's no room of 200 people where you can say, I love every single person in this room, bar none. Right? And our students are the same way. So for me, it becomes really important in the, the tenses that I use. I do not use first person singular ever in rehearsal. Because if a student doesn't like you and you say, I need you to do this for me, good luck, right? Um, what other quotes that, that you've heard from directors, right? Um, I need this, uh, I'm blanking on other, but it, things that make you the focus of their attention. And it makes it about what your standing with a 12 year old is, instead of what their standing with the music is in the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. So I use plural statements as frequently as possible, and also in second person as frequently as possible. It's your choir, it's your section. It's not my choir, right? Sure, I'm there, but if I say, my choir does this, my choir does that, I'm saying that to them in rehearsal, that makes me way too important. If I say, your choir needs you to, and then give them something that they can take action on, that shifts the entire mentality of the group to working for one another and with one another, instead of making it an isolation focused too much on the individual, gives students ownership over their own experience, um, and the students who are not bought into that mentality, um, they, they want choir to be American Idol, they want it to be solo time, karaoke day all the time, right? They want results without hard work, they want it to be cool but not good, they want to be judgmental of others, and they think that they got standing for that. They find their way out of the program really fast, because all that energy that they want you to devote to them being an individual and them caring more about themselves than the rest of the ensemble, it isn't validated. And if you don't respond to that, then those students never have anything to latch onto, and they find their way out of your program because their values aren't being validated. Um, I also try and use generic praise and discipline as frequently as possible. So I'll say, ladies, please put your phones away when I see one then four phones go down, right? Because our school doesn't have, our district doesn't have accompanists for middle school, so I conduct from the piano every single day. I can't walk around the room. My eyes are 14 places at once, and one of those is the kids. Um, so using generic statements, thank you, gentlemen, sopranos do this, <coughs> instead of, again, calling out an individual, Alexia, do this, Ethan, stop talking, right? Gentlemen, stop talking. It's generic, it's plural, and it doesn't bring out the individual in a way that a single direction would. And it also reinforces the team mentality, doesn't make things about me, um, and develops student leadership because then the peers expect a high level of participation um, with one another. I also try and use positive body <coughs> as frequently as possible, um, so smiling with them, making eye contact when they talk, caring about even their video game conversations, um, the neutrality of opinion on song presentation, on uh, individual personalities, whether or not I click with them, that doesn't matter. Um, politics that come up in my classroom, um, those of you who heard the Hamilton soundtrack, the whole talk less, smile more quote, is a steal from that, but like, really that's how I run the Talk less, smile more, let them sing. Um, and then the second last thing that's incredibly important to me is being solutions oriented. We've all been in rehearsals where the director or someone else to say, don't do this, right? Don't stick out. Don't take that deep breath. Don't use that tone. Don't use that much consonant. Don't use that little consonant. Don't use that bow shape. If you're in a 
rehearsal setting as a young student, where all you're, all you're being told is what not to do, they'll never be expressive, and they'll never have that passion that we're hoping to develop in them. Um, Sean Kirshner was talking about this morning about trusting artistry with young students and all musicians. If you tell them what not to do, they'll never trust you, and they'll never trust themselves, and they'll never be able to truly love the product of what they're doing. So instead, what I try and do is frame things with actionable and direct instructions. So instead of saying, don't sing with your mouth closed, they're middle school, they'll come up with 50 other options that also aren't good. Um, <laughs> but if I say, put more space between your teeth, and then lead them into the excerpt again, it's direct, it gives them something concrete to represent, and I haven't told them what not to do. Similarly, don't take a shallow breath. Cool, they're thinking about a shallow breath even more now, right? So if I say, take a deeper preparation breath, and then lead them into the excerpt, then they're practicing those skills that we want them to develop, not thinking about what they shouldn't do, and as a result, not being confined into that scared mindset of, well, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this, I'm just saying triple piano because that's all I feel safe with, right? Um, and I would much rather rein back kids going too far than always encourage them a little bit more, a little bit more, because that's exhausting. But if they go too far and we're like, cool, let's use 90% of that, try it again, that's a way smoother way for me to run rehearsal. I also refer to every single part in rehearsal as the melody. So it's not the soprano melody and then the tenor harmony, because then that tells the tenors that they aren't as important as the sopranos. Right, so tenor two, here's your melody. Basses, here's your melody. I'm very deliberate about that. Um, also about not telling students that things are hard. We've all been in rehearsals and presentations where this is hard, but you just gave the students an excuse to opt out, an excuse to not succeed in what they're doing. Instead, if you just present them with the skills that they need and make those skills actionable, then they can achieve that and they'll never know how hard it actually was because nobody ever told them, but they also never have an excuse to not try because you're always giving them something to work towards. Um, my eighth grade choir consistently sings six to eight part music, um, and they do perfectly fine at festival. I never tell them how hard it is. Uh, last year for festival, one of their charts was an all-state high school jazz piece. The other one was eight part divisi acapella plus trumpet. They were both commissioned for college choirs, and the kids got a superior because they worked towards what they were supposed to be doing. Um, because it was just what was next. It was the next challenge for them. And sure, it wasn't perfect, but they were still proud of the work that they put in. So I try and, when I present songs, say, you're really going to like this piece. Again, these are the second right? This piece is a good fit for your choir. Our ensemble is going to mesh really well with this style, whether or not that they do in the beginning or not. So ultimately what that leads to is developing students' artistic integrity. Um, again, avoiding telling them what not to do and then being like, well, why didn't they sing with emotion? You never give them permission to. Um, if you instill that feeling of trust in students and that belief in their own performance, that's what's really going to hook them. And that feeling is, is addicting. It's what we all involve ourselves with music for, to replicate that feeling of what we love, being truly immersed in it, and truly connected to it to the point where you can't think of, it, of doing it any other way or any less well. That can be cultivated in your students through how you talk to them. It can be cultivated through, in your students through the repertoire that you choose for them and how it connects with them, the techniques that you teach them, but also giving them the opportunity to be artistic, to grow as musicians, and then stay in it long enough to truly develop their appreciation of all genres of music, including classical, so that they can enjoy, enjoy sharing that experience with each other, with you as the director, with the audience, whether they're on stage or in the audience, and enjoy that experience frequently and with a lot of depth. And that's just going to retain your students, recruit more students, and build your program. So, on the last couple pages of your packet, I've included some repertoire that I've used in the past, both from the pop trajectory, as well as once we turn the corner of the festival trajectory. Um, especially with pop music, there are tons of voices available, so don't think, oh, it's only three part mix, I can't do it with my SATV choir. I guarantee you there's an SATV arrangement of whatever pop song it is. Um, and I also tried to include some of the things that um, are highlights in there for technical things that I'm able to teach on those songs, 
and then for the festival repertoire, just some ideas of songs that I have done with students at festival at various points in my program, and found that the students really connected to and really enjoyed preparing songs, and hopefully you might be able to find something in there that you think your students will also connect with based on their personalities and their ensemble mentality, um, and you might be able to use in your programs going forward. So if you all have any questions, I'd be happy to stay and talk to you afterwards. I know we're, uh, oh, we got time for two, two right now? All right, we'll do two right now. Yeah. Do you use the sight singing program that you use? No. Um, I use a sight singing workbook that is very developmental, step by step. It starts with like four quarter notes on middle C, four quarter notes on D, e, four quarter notes on E. Um, it progresses them up to the point of what they need for the middle school all state audition. And we don't do sight singing outside of that. Uh, but then I hand them off to the high school director, and they've got enough of a foundation that I'm pretty sure last year at high school, every single one of the groups got a one in sight singing, regardless of what the rest of their performance was. Um, so I give them a foundational um, instruction to it, and kind of a, an awareness, but I don't spend all of my time that isn't targeted towards Allstate for that. Any other questions? If anything comes up, uh, ask me at lunch tomorrow with our middle school directors or see me in the hall. Um, but thank you all so much for your time and for being here.